Welcome to Canada's podcast. Hello, this is Robert Smigo with Canada's podcast, where we talk to the entrepreneurs who are making it happen here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Today, our guest is Ria Deboy Phillips. Ria is a public relations executive with three decades of global experience across diverse industries. She spent 20 years with global PR giant Edelman Public Relations, working across major Asian markets, advising major corporations like ING, Samsung, and Starbucks, as well as running the Edelman Off Vancouver office and leading accounts such as Canfor, Colliers, and the Vancouver Port Authority. Ria recently started her own consultancy, Winter Cove Communications. Her new firm just completed a successful merger campaign for two Alberta-based credit unions, paving the way for the creation of Canada's largest credit union. Ria, welcome to Canada's podcast. Thanks for taking the time today to share your entrepreneurial journey with all our listeners. Hi, Robert. It's so nice to be here. Really appreciate you reaching out and the opportunity to chat with you. Great. I hope I got your last name right. Did I get, did I get that one right? Did I know. It's a mouthful. Uh, try spelling that out in Asia for 15 years. Um, yeah. It's actually Rhea Dubois Phillips. Dubois. Okay. A little bit of French in there. Okay. I know. Some... Got it. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your current business. I know you're located in the kind of the Point Grey area of Vancouver. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, originally from Vancouver and then uh, went to school here and did uh, an undergrad at UBC and then sort of set off in a lot of different areas, lived in the United States, worked for the uh, Canadian Embassy in Washington during the first time of NAFTA, and then went back to school in Europe. Um, so lived in uh, France, in Paris, went to the Sorbonne and moved to England to do a master's in postmodernism, uh, highly relevant at the University of London. And uh, so it was great because it had gave me the opportunity to live abroad and experience living in different cities, setting up life in a new culture. And uh, following my master's, I thought, you know, what what do you necessarily do with a master's in postmodernism? Well, you um, meet a meet a young man and end up uh, moving to Jakarta, Indonesia, as you do. And I uh, lived uh, started a journey in Asia for about fifteen years, where. I worked in public relations, uh, both in-house and then joining Edelman uh, and working throughout their network in Asia, uh, having children, uh, experiencing a lot of different places there, and then eventually moving back here to Vancouver, still with Edelman. We made an acquisition here during the Olympics, and uh, and so I ended up running their Vancouver office most recently. Okay, so it's been so a bit of a yeah. varied journey. Yeah. Good. You've traveled a lot. You've worked mm-hmm. in major corporations. How has that kind of, as far as helped you work and become an entrepreneur, how have you taken the skills you've learned in a corporate environment, international travel, working with international clients, and now you're embarking upon yourself on your own company? How does that help enrich your entrepreneurial experience? And what does that bring to the table for your clients? So I didn't necessarily realize it at the time. But all those experiences accumulatively have kind of prepared me for this moment of a pretty big leap of faith to start my own company. Um, And I felt that it has provided me with a really strong basis. I have great experience uh, working with a variety of companies. And I'm very thankful to Edelman for the, um, the training that they provided me with all those years working for them, uh, the discipline, the understanding of how to approach communications, how to pitch for new business. When I was uh, running the Vancouver office, I was fully accountable for um, you know my budget, building business, hiring people, unfortunately, sometimes letting people go, which is extremely difficult, but just managing the business. Richard Edelman is uh, the CEO. His father founded the company. It's the largest privately held uh, public relations agency, and I really respect his entrepreneurial spirit. So each office is tasked with running it as almost a small business. So all those years really prepared me for this moment where I was thinking, how do I build business? How do I launch a company? What is my you know sort of long term plan, and how does it all fit together? So I think it really taught me um, 
a little bit about business uh, and has prepared me for, you know, embarking on my own. So it didn't really feel like uh, a very daunting task because I had been through that a lot with the Vancouver office, especially during a very challenging time of COVID. I also lived through two Asian financial crises. So, you know, I've been through a lot of ups and downs in the economy where, you know, companies contract, often public relations and communications is the first budget to be cut. So I'm well versed in losing business, trying to find business in a challenging environment, expanding business. Uh, so I've been through a lot of different cycles that I think have well prepared me for starting my own very small shop. Okay, you're in the communications business. Okay, what mm -hmm. is one piece of knowledge, information about your industry that the common per person may not know about? Can you give us some insight into your industry, maybe something that... Uh, not be common knowledge with other people that are looking for side? That's a tough question. I don't think there's any, you know, golden secret to public relations. I think sometimes PR gets a bad rap as spin doctors. Um, you know, I haven't worked for companies that try to deceive the public uh, with communications, although it's often portrayed that way in, in the media and in, you know, movies and books. It's not really like that. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for communications is getting a message out because now we're just inundated with so much content coming from so many different sources 24-7. So the biggest challenge is how do, how do you make what you're saying relevant to the people you want to reach? How do you ensure that they hear you? Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge. I think the biggest uh, key to success in that area is making it relevant for people. And whether that's, you know, a creative concept that can bring your message to life uh, and make it some kind of emotional connection with your audiences is very important because people are scrolling, people are, you know, listening to you while doing something else. They're multitasking. It's just such a crowded environment. So the ability to kind of break through is very difficult, but uh, you really need to think about what you're trying to achieve and the problem you're trying to solve, and then somehow bring it to life for the audiences that you need to reach. Okay. But there's no one size fits all for communications, that's for sure. Yeah. And every sector is different, every task. Um, and there's just so many different channels to use. And I think entrepreneurs, even when they're launching, uh, it's, it's an extremely exciting time, but you need to think about how you do it, what channels you're engaging, how well prepared you are, and I think that's really the key to success for all those years launching companies, products, ideas, new CEOs, new boards, whatever it was we were doing. Uh, we always had to think about the, you know, the most important step is launching it into the, into the public realm and how you do that. And you have to be extremely well prepared for that because you only get one shot to do it properly. Okay, Winter Cove just launched. What's the mm -hmm. long-term vision of your company? Do you see the company expand in, into other areas? Uh, I know you're doing work in Alberta, but are you looking to expand outside of Canada and get clients internationally? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the great um, outcomes of you know a terrible time in the world with COVID was that we all learned to be flexible and work remotely. So I kind of laugh because we had these clients, uh, two fantastic credit unions based in Alberta. I met with them three to four times a week, often many times a day for almost seven months. And I've not met any of them in person. So I think that really speaks to the efficiency of remote working, the teamwork, uh, the dynamic of being able to pull people into meetings when you need them, not having to get on an airplane and fly somewhere, incur the cost of travel and the and the expense and uh, kind of the headache at times, quite frankly. So it really uh, worked exceptionally well to have us all remote and to be able to connect when we needed to be. Um, it is a little surreal not to have ever met our clients in person, but uh, I think the outcome is what matters, and we got them both to a yes vote. Um, so, you know, kind of the proofs and the outcome. It's a very unique dynamic. So that speaks to the ability to be able to work for clients wherever they are in the world. And I think what we're offering um, to clients is sort of the direct access to a very small but highly experienced team. Uh, we don't have the overhead that, you know, larger agencies have to incur. Um, and we're just, you know, 
nimble and being Agile. able to meet those those you know the needs of clients anywhere and time zone and you know it doesn't really matter okay good let's talk a little bit about british columbia and doing business where you are we're both from vancouver so we can speak with experience mm -hmm. here what are the biggest yeah. benefits for you being an entrepreneur in british columbia give me some of the good things about working there and give me some of the challenges that you have had to overcome over the years I think businesses here have a very unique approach to um, consulting, uh, not probably not just communications, uh, other services as well. Uh, they're very hesitant to lock into uh, long term established contracts with agencies. Uh, and my biggest competitor, ironically, when I was running uh, an agency was a freelancer. And so that that's a very unique characteristic of uh, British Columbia companies. So they, it, for me now, it provides an amazing opportunity because I'm the type of profile of engagement that they like, um, direct access to experienced consultants without having to lock into a retainer agreement. So that's great. The problem is, is that there are not a lot of companies that are based in Vancouver. Uh, there's, you know, TELUS, Quadreal, Lululemon, you know, there are a few, but not many versus, uh, you know, Toronto office is rife with headquarter companies with larger budgets who hold often the decision making on communications. So that's a bit of a challenge and you have to be flexible and think about how you can approach different companies uh, and maybe smaller mandates, shorter projects, you know, just be flexible on the approach to it. But it is a very different landscape than it is in Toronto. Um, and even in Alberta, you know, there are a lot of resource-based companies in Alberta with headquarter offices there. But um, here is, it's very different. It, you know, people move here for the fantastic lifestyle. It's a gorgeous city. It has so much to offer. Um, but there are not a lot of headquarter companies here. Okay. Just to segue from that answer, which yeah. is really complete. Um, we get a lot of immigration in Canada and in British Columbia. If someone wants to move here, and they're listening, say, from a different country, what kind of advice would you give them and say, here's here's what to expect, here's what you'd be looking at, here's some good advice from, from someone who is from British Columbia? I think it for you mean an entrepreneur coming here to set up a business? Yeah, yeah. You were if you were coming here, imagine yourself coming here for the very first time, knowing what you know now, mm -hmm. what would you do differently, or what would you kind of advise someone who's kind of said, Hey, you're sitting down having coffee, I just landed here, I want to start a business. What would you recommend? Well, I would hope that even before they arrive, they kind of do their homework. It's not an easy city to break into. Like it's a, it's a great setting, but it's challenging. Uh, it's a very high cost of living, which people don't necessarily expect here. Um, salaries aren't particularly as high here as they are in maybe other parts of Canada or other cities, for example, in the U.S. Uh, and I think networking here can be somewhat challenging. So I've heard that, you know, repeatedly over the years, not only uh, professionally and socially, it's it's a uh, it's challenging city to break into. So I would always encourage people who are planning to move here and planning to set up a company to try and start networking. Now there's so many online forums and clubs you can join and become members of in advance. Uh, research kind of the areas that you would want to target the demographics, uh, your competitors, I think your competitors provide an enormous amount of insight to the business. Who are they working for? What kind of projects are they posting? Uh, what are the opportunities in the market? I think LinkedIn is a wealth of information too, and it's a great way to connect with colleagues, competitors, companies. You can see who's hiring, who's firing, who's got budget, who doesn't, uh, trends in the market. So I think it's all a matter of really opening yourself to making connections. Once you're here, I think, you know, we have a lot of different areas of the lower mainland. And I think it depends on the type of business that you're setting up. So you'd want to think about, you know, what area of the city mo makes the most sense for me. I know that a lot of people who first moved to Vancouver moved downtown. Uh, rentals downtown are very transient, very expensive, high cost of living. Is that the smartest move for somebody who's just arriving here? Do they want to move into a smaller community uh, and make some you know, true connections to get a business off the ground? Or do they want to be in the heart of the city where they're targeting big business who might be you know, sponsors or clients of the business that you're launching? 
So there's so much at play, but I think preparation is really important and getting to know the city and the different areas um, and figuring out what organizations you can join so you can network. You know, the Board of Trade in each organization is um, very active and they offer a lot of opportunity for networking and they're trying to bring back a lot of in-person networking. As, you know, so that's key as well for making connections in a new city. And those are the types of places for entrepreneurs that I would highly suggest starting and just getting to out and meeting people. I mean, that's where connections are truly made is, is networking and going to events and launches and figuring out, you know, who's active and who's hiring and who's got budget to, to support your business. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your morning routine. Uh, entrepreneurs are very active people, very <laughs> yes. disciplined people. Um, health is important, obviously, because they are uh, they never really do get a day off. Uh, what's your morning routine like? Do you are you pretty strict with that? Um, health wise, exercise wise, eating right is that a major? Focus I mean, I you? think everyone has great intentions, right? But life gets in the way. I'm a working mom. I've got uh, teenage kids, uh, which means that. Pretty well, no two days are the same. Uh, my husband travels a lot. You know, we've got dogs. There's always people coming and going in the house. So, you know, I I think I try to be uh, flexible and not too regimented so that if I don't get up and get to my Peloton bike at 7 a.m., it's okay. I can revisit it later on in the day. Uh, absolutely huge supporter of daily exercise. Um, I have two black labs. I live near a forest. I try to get in there at least once a day with them. I find that incredibly relaxing. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful thing to do. And I really enjoy my time in there with my dogs. Um, exercise, I try to work out. I, I also um, find that now that I have a, a bike at home, I can do a lot of different classes. There's so many apps. Like I, I think that Trying to at least get one exercise in per day is usually my goal. It doesn't always happen, but that's my goal. So I think that's a big part of it. You know, we're up and at it early because kids are going to school. Dogs need to go out. I mean, my, my dogs remind me that it's time for breakfast every morning. So there's a lot going on, but uh, just try to remain flexible. It's Life is busy. And then, you know, at the end of the day, I am now finding that for me, as I get older, falling asleep is more challenging. You know, you worry about your kids or you listen to the news cycle. There's just so much happening. So, you know, recently I've tried to um, start some meditations before bed, which has been fantastic for me. I, I Somebody equated it to driving a car at 75 miles an hour and then just trying to lie down and go to sleep immediately. It just doesn't work. So you need that sort of yeah. transition to calm your mind. And I'm finding that really helpful now because, uh, as I said, the news cycle is pretty disturbing. Um, there's lots happening in life and you just sort of need to unwind and clear your mind so you can get some sleep. Okay. Another thing is entrepreneurs are avid readers. And I see you have quite a selection of books there. Uh can you recommend any entrepreneurial business books that you've read that have helped you on your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I mean, I really try to, I'm a big believer in consuming news in very many formats. So I read, I recently read The Rockefeller Habits that um, a girlfriend of mine who's a CEO uh, recommended, and it was fantastic. Um, and you can take, you know, just a few pointers from each of these books I find very useful. I think as an entrepreneur, the number one key is being aware of current events in the news cycle because everything is so interconnected. You need to understand what's happening in the world so that it affects the economy, which will ultimately affect your business, as well as the local nuances. So in the morning, I always have you know, the CBC radio, uh, I always play that my local Vancouver show. So I understand kind of what's going on in the city, what's happening around town. Um, I listen to a variety of podcasts. You know, I, I, I find uh, Scott Galloway a fantastic insight into kind of the tech world and, and all that's happening. Um, I listen to the New York Times, the daily podcast. I find that very insightful. I do audiobooks because I have a lot of soccer carpool duties in the evening, so I, I listen to a lot of, I know, Audible. I, I love that. Um, and just try to find, you know, different sources of information. I still subscribe to a newspaper that comes to my home every morning, probably uh, not too many of us left, uh, old school newspaper readers. But I just find consuming information from a lot of different sources is a really healthy way to 
find a balanced approach of what's going on in the world so that you don't sort of enter that echo chamber where you're just validating your own thoughts through your own channels that are being fed to you on, you know, your social media. So I think that's really important to have a variety of, of, um, of sources. I mean, I think even what happened this week earlier with um, OpenAI, I think that was a f- like really interesting news story uh, and how it just exemplified a complete communication failure by that by that board who was totally out of touch with their you know employees who were willing to leave. You know, he had 700 employees willing to sign a petition to follow Stan Altman, who must be an incredibly engaging and dynamic leader at his very young age. Uh, and then for the, you know, the CEO of Microsoft to swoop in and just say, you know, we'll start a business. Like it just, it was such a, a rich dynamic corporate, uh, event week. And I think we could all learn something from that because I think if, if, uh, if leaders don't understand or have, are not engaged with their employee base, whether you have a thousand or whether you have three, uh, your your business is not going to be successful. I, I've spent a lot of time in employee engagement. It's a big passion of mine. And I think people really overlook the value and the importance of their employees as their most important asset. So even if, as I said, even if you have only a few of them, your company will only be as successful as the degree to which they are engaged and motivated and wanting to make for the success of the company. Okay, let's get to know you a little bit more. If you were doing what you do now, what would you like to do for a profession? For a profession? Oh, wow. Well, like if I could do anything. Anything. Yeah, if you were in the communications yeah. business, yeah. it's completely something different. What would it be? Oh, I wish I could sing. I, you know, like I look at, uh, at great singers, you know, and that would be a real passion for me. I, I have no singing ability whatsoever, but that would be a dream if I could be a singer. Okay. So you just uh, like to sing at home and sing to records. In the, yes, much okay. to the chagrin of my kids who just okay. don't enjoy those moments, I'm sure. <laughs> what what two words would you use to describe yourself? The words that people might say. I am uh very persistent and I'm extremely caring. I think those would be two words that describe me. Okay. Um, what keeps you up at night? Anything? I mean, now that you've kind of gone from corporate life to on, on your own, Winter Cove is out there now. Uh, do you find yourself thinking more about, you know, not shutting it off at night? Do you find that? Yeah. I mean, I always rich? find that interesting question. I think uh, life keeps me up at night. Like, you know, they say you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. So when you have children, I think you have a whole new degree of concern about where they're going in the world, especially with the way the economy is, you know, geopolitical instabilities, like there's just so much happening all the time. Is there one thing that keeps me up at night? Does the the future of Winter Cove or any of those things? Not specifically, I think it's more about just where things are at and how my kids are doing. Uh, I might have a a big client event, you know, th- happening the next day, the night before the yes vote, you know, thinking, okay, have we done all that we can to get this across the line? You know, life just happens. And I think that's what keeps me up at night and and thinking about, did I get everything done? What's tomorrow bringing? There's just always so much going on. And so I do often lie in bed at night uh, thinking about a lot of different things, um, but uh, there's not one specific thing that recurs, fortunately, uh, every night. But it's just, you know, general life concerns uh, make, you know, make it difficult to sleep sometimes, for sure. Okay. You've got an extensive career. You've worked internationally. You've worked in Canada and abroad and uh, highly educated. You've met a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, founders, business executives. Is there a common trait that you've noticed amongst all these individuals that maybe stands out that you go, whether it's an entrepreneur who was a client or individuals like yourself, would you say there's a common trait or a personality trait or a, a certain way they deal with things? Or is there anything yeah. that kind of a thread that you've noticed in your career? I imagine and there's a ton of, you know, all the people you've worked with on high mm-hmm. level owners mm-hmm. that you could say, yeah, you know what, come to think of it, there is this one trait that I've, I've recognized with a lot of them. Maybe there isn't, I don't know. Is there, did you say? I think there are a few, you know, the okay. most inspirational leaders that I have met and worked for in my life have been uh, generally very happy and positive people. 
Uh, and I think they are living what they want to be doing at that moment in their life. They're, they're engaged, they're driven and they're visionary. And I'll, you know, the, uh, the most exciting project that I, I think ever worked on was one of the first in Indonesia where I worked for a visionary, brilliant genius, uh, by the name of Adi Adiwoso. And he had this vision for Indonesia that he wanted to bring satellite handphone telephony to his country. Uh, because it's, as you can imagine, with the collection of islands, it's just so difficult to get telecommunications, yet there's a lot of shipping and a lot of mining, and there's so much going on in that country. So this goes back, you know, 30 years. Uh, there wasn't much in that space in that part of the world. And he, from this, his, you know, from the base of Jakarta, made connections with Lockheed Martin, Hughes, Telsat Canada, the Russian Space Agency. We partnered with um, different organizations within each of the Asian countries within that footprint. And we launched the first satellite handphone project for Asia. The most exciting moment of my professional career was flying to the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and standing on the mound with the Russian Space Agency and with representatives from Lockheed Martin from the US launching this you know 500 million dollar rocket spaceship into uh you know on the horizon and the rocket that went off just before us was for uh Sirius XM the they were launching their satellites for their satellite uh, ra radio program before us and their rocket there it, it exploded so there was such tension on that mound and the insurance companies there with the 100 million dollar insurance policy and there was Adiwoso, and he had this vision, and he there it was coming to life for him. We had a successful launch. We launched this handphone project. Ericsson from Sweden had made this handset, and he was just overwhelmed with happiness, and the teamwork that he brought together to make that happen was inspirational. And I think he's always stood out as quite an just a, a charismatic leader who had great vision um, and was able to bring a lot of diverse partners together, geographically, culturally, philosophically, to achieve something amazing for his country and for the region. So that was a very exciting project, um, highly memorable. Uh, and it really showed me that, you know, that kind of vision and dream can happen through collaboration. And he was the master at collaboration. Okay. Is there any advice that you've received from yeah. entrepreneurs, business owners along the way that you could pass on to entrepreneurs? Yeah, okay. no, I think I think you have to be so flexible because nothing will ever go according to plan. Uh, when I moved to Asia, uh, everything was very stable when I was doing all my planning. As soon as I got there, the Asian financial crisis hit I Indonesia. Um, it was the single largest, most significant collapse of a currency ever. And they overthrew Suharto and there were riots in the street. So I was thinking, this is really a long way from home. <laughs> this is not at all what I planned. And when I was interviewing for that job, the communications role, they said, you know, this is kind of Indonesia is like a burning house right now. Everybody is running out and you, you're this one foreigner that's running in why are you here? And I'm like, well, I am all the way here. This is not the experience I thought it was going to be, but I'm sure it will be a very interesting one. And it was, it was, it was fabulous. It was life-changing. And I just think you have to be flexible and you have to open yourself up to different opportunities because the original plan will never be the one that, that, that uh, unfolds. And that's okay because it'll end up in a different place. And maybe that's the way it was meant to be. Maybe it wasn't. But as long as you give it your best and sort of adapt to the situation, I think the outcome will be better. Good. Okay, Rhea, how can our listeners get all of you? And is there anything you'd like to add before you leave us? They can find us at our website, uh, wintercove.com. Uh, all our contacts and you know channels through LinkedIn and Instagram are, are there. Um, you know, I just, uh, I really thank you for the opportunity to chat about it. I know that there are a lot of entrepreneurs in British Columbia I'd love to chat with anybody if they if anything I've said has kind of sparked your interest or if you wanted to talk through any more ideas or 
you know, it's all about making connections. And, and I love to hear from anybody who's starting out or who's been doing this for a while and can offer me some great advice about how I might make my company stronger going forward. Excellent. Okay. Well, Rhea, thank you for coming on the show. I've learned a lot about you and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Thanks, Robert. Really great to meet you. And thank you so much for taking the time with me. Great. Okay. We'll see you next time.